All right, so we talked about some guys who are potentially leaving the roster. Let's talk about some guys who could potentially be coming to the roster. Uh, there was a report that was, a, you know, speculation that got aggregated as a report um, that the Packers plan to release David Bakhtiari. I think the writing is a little bit on the wall there. Um, obviously, he's buddy buddy with our our prince, our hero, QB one, Aaron Rodgers. What are your thoughts on Bakhtiari as a potential addition to the Jets? Yeah, so uh, these three guys we're going to talk about are almost like a little silly, right? Like we're not we're not diving deep into free agents here. We're talking about three. No, this is this is hot take news. Yeah, this is our exactly. <laughs> so so Bakhtiari, um, I think it's been pretty well covered. The kind of the the pros and cons, right? Like, does he want to play on turf? Um, he's been pretty outspoken about grass for the moment. We still have turf. Uh, he's like kind of over the hill kind of is I'm using very loosely there. Like, can he still play basically is what I'm saying. Um, is he going to miss a bunch of games? We've had a ton of bad luck with older linemen getting injured the last few years and missing significant amounts of time. I think he played one game last year. So like even less than Dwayne Brown, um, you know, there's a few examples of that going back a few years now of, of that really not working for us. Ryan Khalil, I think, was the first example of it. And there's been a bunch since then culminating with um, with Dwayne Brown. And so uh, I do want to talk about like a little bit of a different angle with it. So first of all, thank God we didn't trade for Bakhtiari. Not that it was ever really that real of a possibility, but it was something that got talked about like a whole bunch Last offseason, during the year, like at different times, they were talking about trading for Bakhtiari. They were talking about as being part of the Aaron Rodgers trade where he w- we would have to take on that contract as a part of whatever compensation, right, to eat all that money. Um, and so thank God we didn't take him at that price tag at whatever point. Um, so that's like my first kind of thought there. Is, um, you know, if we do, if we are able to get him, and again, this has been well covered, so we don't need to talk about it up and down, but like, hopefully it's not a starting left tackle option. Hopefully it's a backup swing option. Hopefully there's another rookie that's involved as well. And this is just kind of an insurance policy. Like all of those things are kind of taken as a given here. Um, And the other angle I would say is like, we all, myself included, you included, we all did a lot of complaining about Aaron Rodgers baggage last year. Um, And I think justifiably so, like none of them were very good. Lazard was outright bad. Cobb flashed a couple times and there was probably an element that we couldn't see on the practice field of helping the younger guys and helping Xavier Gibson. So Cobb is whatever. Um, I mean, Billy Turner was a goddamn nightmare. Dalvin Cook was horrible. Like the baggage was bad. Hackett is probably the top primary example of that. And um, the there was an article that was released on the Badlands feed over the weekend, kind of taking a different approach to Hackett and talking about, you know, let's look at these historically great quarterbacks and the offensive coordinators that they've had the most success with. And the findings of that article were by and large that like sometimes, most of the time, <laughs> When you have these coordinators who are paired with these quarterbacks, they don't do really well outside of that quarterback. So there's something to be said for the chemistry of an offensive coordinator and a quarterback working together. And so, you know, and and it's basically that these offensive coordinators aren't great on their own. They're not great when they're away from these quarterbacks. But for some reason, putting these quarterbacks with these offensive coordinators makes the quarterback better, makes the offensive coordinator better, makes the team better. So it's, it was kind of a chemistry thesis statement for this article. And I wonder Leads if we could say the same. Adam Gase five years later. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we could say the same about all of Rogers baggage. Like we saw all of his baggage without him, right? We didn't see Lazard catching passes from him. We didn't see Billy Turner blocking for him when he knows what Aaron Rodgers is doing behind him. We didn't see Cobb with him. We didn't see him handing the ball off to Dalvin Cook. We didn't see him working with Nate Hackett, right? So maybe um, there's another angle to this Bakhtiari thing where there is a trust factor that will be beneficial to the team. And it's not so much that Bakhtiari is going to be an all-pro left tackle or anything like that, but just that 
maybe some of this baggage will be a little better when he's back behind center. And and I hate to keep going back to the refrain of like Aaron Rodgers is going to fix everything. But again, like all this Bakhtiari stuff has been talked about up, down, left and right. So just trying to take a little bit of a different angle on it here. And like maybe the pairing is worth more than the part is what I'm getting at. Damn, I like off-season Paul. Off-season Paul is an optimist. This is like new, <laughs> fun. And You're like happy about, I mean, yeah, I'll take it. I will take it. Obviously, you know, we've, we've said this, warm body, nothing more. Hopefully not planning to have 16 games of David Bakhtiari as your starting left tackle. But, you know, if he's on a vet minimum deal to make Aaron Rodgers happy, who am I to stop you? It's not like he, you know, said really shitty things about the Jets as a fan base and uh, left the team and was a horrible player <laughs> elsewhere after leaving, after saying he was going to be this all pro Hall of Fame caliber player who now wants to return to the team. Anyways, next topic. What are your thoughts on Jamal Adams? Coming back <laughs> to the Jets? My God, has there ever been a more enjoyable downfall? to watch i should then. i should give this a more proper setup than just backhanding this i think i think what we should say is that there have been rumblings on jets twitter about you know we talked about it there's one safety currently signed to the roster there's an open hole in the roster jamal adams is likely not playing for the seahawks anymore could a return be possible besides you know what's the things i uh, sorry but besides all the things i mentioned from like a pr standpoint about how he was mean to you know mean to the fans and like not a good fit for the team and a diva and the way he forced his way out and the fact that him getting traded from the jets is the single reason that joe douglas is still the general manager for the jets like without jamal adams joe douglas would have been fired a long time ago because he doesn't get the chance to draft garrett wilson and uh jermaine johnson and Brees hall all in the same draft but besides that point he sucked at football for the last two years he's been really really bad at football there is no part of me that wants him anywhere near this roster it's not even like a matter of is the distraction worth the good play it's like it's distracting and it's horrible play there's no part of this that Jets fans should remotely entertain I'm sorry to whoever aggregated this idea and said that it was a good one but by all means can we stop talking about Jamal Adams coming back to the Jets <laughs> You know, what's funny is we did that whole safety segment before and I knew we were talking about Jamal Adams later and he never even entered my mind as a potential name to talk about in that safety segment. And it's not because I knew we were talking about him later. It's just because, like you said, he's not good at football. So it never even crossed my mind to bring him into that segment, which I'm just realizing now. The Jamal Adams talk is making my head swim because there's so many directions I want to go in it with. First of which is that my in-laws who are uh, subscribers to Badlands and great people, they live in Seattle, they're Seahawks fans. And it's been so hard not to constantly dog this guy every time I talk to them about the Seahawks because he is, he's so bad and we got so much for him. And luckily for Seahawks fans, they were able to pull off a similar heist with Russell Wilson. Like they were almost able to erase that for themselves by offloading Russell Wilson and kind of resetting themselves. And they're in an okay position now because of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, this guy's so bad and he hasn't like, he hasn't even moved on from the jets. He was so like loud and boisterous and annoying when he was here. And there's a period of time when he's on your team where you like it. And then it crosses a, it crosses a line where it sours and you're like, I, get this guy away from me. Like I need the blast well, radius, like away from my team. It's yeah, it's not worth it. And it was, and it was a similar thing with Rex. And I, I look upon Rex fondly now and I don't with Jamal Adams, but like there was a point where Rex crossed a line when the team wasn't good anymore, where it was like, all right, dude, like enough, shut up, stop talking. Um, and like I said, I still kind of look upon Rex friendly, um, not the same with Jamal Adams. And I think, you know, if we if we put the draft pick aside for a second, because who we could have drafted instead is a long book that we don't want to open um, because it's very sad. And we yes. like we just shouldn't go there on this podcast. So if we put that aside for a second, <laughs> the, the player initially was exciting. 
and he proclaimed that he was going to kind of spearhead changing the culture in New York. And it, at the time it gave me like Keyshawn Johnson vibes because you're a little bit, you're a little bit young to remember this, but like in the mid nineties, when we drafted Keyshawn, like it had been desolate for a few years before that. And me and my family had season tickets and the first touchdown that Keyshawn Johnson scored at the old Meadowlands, he like, he ripped off his helmet, he spiked his helmet and he like went over to the sidewall and like, kind of like put his arms up to the crowd and the place went ballistic dude. And it was like, Oh my God, like, this is exciting. Like we haven't had anybody like this in a long time. And it kind of like ignited something. And when Jamal Adams first got here, it felt like he was going to do something similar. Um, and it, it just soured so quickly. And I think one of the, the tweets that kind of got this whole thing going this week was that somebody said like, come back and play for the jets or something. And he responded to it and he said, he basically, liked, I didn't I think he liked it. Right. He liked it. But then he also said the reason that he left was I didn't want to play for my head coach. And so like, yeah, obviously dude. And <laughs> so I went back and I looked at all the coaches that were hired in 2019 and listen to this list, man, <sighs> Matt LaFleur, Zach Taylor, are the two like those are the two high level names cliff kingsbury bruce arians those are the other two kind of i would call mid-tier good offensive names freddie kitchens trash um the defensive coaches higher that year were fangio and flores um and then mccarthy mike mccarthy was also out there because he got fired to get lafleur in, in green bay but he didn't get a job and it's interesting to think about the alternate reality of like, what if we don't hire Gase? And there's so many avenues of that alternate reality, right? But like in the Jamal Adams specific alternate reality where we don't hire Gase, he doesn't want to leave. Maybe the culture does continue to change under a guy like LaFleur or Zach Taylor. You could argue what is Zach Taylor without Joe Burrow? We don't really know. Um, but it's an interesting thing to think about of like, to go back to what it felt like when it was good with Jamal Adams. Um, and then like kind of extrapolate that forward without ever having gotten Gase. Like, do we ever move on from Donald? Do we ever make that other court quarterback pick? Do we ever, you know, um, obviously Joe Douglas is still here, but like what's different if Gase doesn't come in, is Jamal Adams still here? Does that whole downfall with him still occur here? Like, it's just an interesting thing to think about. And it's a long winded way of me taking five minutes to trash on a guy who sucks at football and say that I don't want him back here. Um, and I think Meigs actually tweeted this week and it was pretty funny. I'm not sure if he, I hope he wasn't serious, but the tweet was basically like Jamal Adams, put him in the Bryce Huff role. And uh, that, I mean, <laughs> rushing the quarterback is all Honestly, he can do, yeah. dude. He's not good in coverage. He's not a safety. He's that gadget off ball linebacker that you can, blitz and make run around and do all kinds of things, but he's an absolute liability on the back end of the secretary. So again, long winded way of, of me saying, no, don't, don't bring this guy back here. Um, and I think it's been well covered too, that he burned so many bridges on his way out. Like it's just not worth it. There's nothing that would make it worth it. So last piece of news, and this is, you know, the, the spiciest of rumors, the hottest of takes, you know, not, not necessarily any truth behind this, but I think it was the Jake Asman show was talking about possibility of Corey Davis returning to football. Uh, here's a player who welcome with open arms, like not only by all accounts, great guy, great person, uh, but like we need help at receiver like so bad this year, last year would have been drastically different with Corey Davis. I know when he was like the guy in New York, he never quite lived up to the hype. And I don't know that we ever really truly paid him to be the guy. You know, he's never been like a Devontae Adams 30 million per type receiver. Um, but he was certainly a big free agent acquisition for Joe Douglas, who didn't quite live up to the hype. But we need to surround, we need to surround Garrett Wilson with two more pass catchers this offseason. Two more quality guys. The draft is a great way to do that. Um, although we obviously have a major glaring need at offensive line too. So I don't know that a first round receiver is going to be on the board for us, but either way, we need to find two, you know, whether it's free agency, the draft, we need to find two supporting role players around Garrett Wilson, whether that's a Brock Bowers type who can catch the ball and block, but 
Corey Davis returning would immediately fill like the wide receiver three role in that need um, with, you know, the high end potential to be wide receiver two. I know the money was very similar to Lazard, um, but like Lazard, as you mentioned, was a no show last season. So I know a lot of people were talking about cutting Corey when we signed Lazard. It's now like the opposite where it's like, please come back and be the guy that Lazard was not last year. Um, so Corey, I would obviously welcome with open arms. I don't know if you feel differently, but um, in if this spicy rumor were true, what would your thoughts be? 100% agreement. I think, first of all, like let's let's talk about that piece about Corey Davis has never been the 30 million a year Devontae Adams guy. You're right. In the NFL, he has not been that. But he was drafted fifth overall. He was drafted to be that. Um, that's what he thought. That's what everybody thought he was coming out of Western Michigan. Um, and so if you look at his career, he gets drafted to Tennessee in 2017, I think Mariota, (laughs) Tannehill, and then Zach Wilson, right? So I think it, it was easy for us as Jets fans to look at his time here and the contract he got and what he was expected to be coming in and say, well, he never lived up to that. And there were there were visible drops. He dropped the ball a whole bunch. Um, there was also an unquantifiable piece that when he was on the field, the offense performed better. And it wasn't necessarily captured in his receiving stats because it, it wasn't like he was putting up gaudy numbers or anything like that. But it was because he was missing a lot of games with injuries and different things. And there was an unquantifiable element of just the offense was better when he was there. And so I think like that's my angle here is that if Corey Davis, if whatever was going on with him that caused him to retire last year, I don't know if it was physical issues or family issues or whatever, right? We did a podcast actually the day it was like one of our first shows together the day that he retired and we got on there and like we we gave it five minutes at the beginning and we didn't know what to say. We were like. I don't know what's going on with this guy. I don't know if something's going on in his personal life. So whatever it was that made him step away from the game, if that is rectified and he's ready to play again, I can't think of a downside. Like I can't think of anybody that this doesn't help. It, it obviously helps the offense. It'll help Corey Davis because he will get to play with a real quarterback. God willing. Right. If, if Rogers can play a good amount of games next year, it, it, he'll play with a, competent quarterback for the first time in his career. So it helps him. It takes pressure off Lazard. It gives us the ability to put in a package with both him and Lazard with two really good blockers on the outside wide receiver position that enables the run game. It frees up Garrett Wilson a little bit. It gives us a big possession receiver to go over the middle. Um, It allows us to be a little bit more creative in who we bring in from a free agent perspective, because now we don't need a big possession guy. So like, I can't really think of a downside here and I don't know how the money works with all that. If he just goes back to his original contract and how that affects the salary cap and being retired and not being retired. Like I can't speak to that piece of it. So financially I don't fully grasp it, but from an on-field football perspective, I really can't think of a downside here. I think it kind of benefits not only him and not only the offense, but kind of everybody else individually also because it allows the Jets to be so much more creative schematically and kind of who they bring in personnel wise. So I'm like all in on Corey Davis coming back if it's a possibility. And I'm not worried about the fact that he missed games and the fact that he had drops because he's not the number one right receiver here anymore. And he's not going to be expected to be, and he's going to be playing with a real quarterback for the first time in his life. Please come back, Corey, please. Um, (laughs) That's it for us this week. Uh, we're going to wrap in a second. But, Paul, before we wrap, I know you wanted to let the other guys' listeners know about some Badlands merch stuff that you've been working on on the back end. So why don't you give them all the inside scoop? Yeah, I saw some chatter in the Discord this morning about people clamoring for the hat that Connor has worn on the War Room podcast a few times. It's a white hat with kind of a rope across the front. It's a cool hat. It's probably way too cool for me. Um but I think a lot of our listeners are of the right age group to be wearing a cool hat like this. And um, so we are basically going to be doing a series of limited merch runs. We're going to try to make them kind of super high quality things that you actually want. So rather than quantity, it's going to be quality. And we are launching a website to support that. So it's badlandstoj.com. 
initially the website is mainly just going to be a place that links out to the podcast, links out to everybody's social platforms and provides a place for us to fulfill these orders, which I will be personally hand doing for you. So if you get one, that means it came from me. And uh, eventually, maybe that website expands out to being kind of a hub for all the different things that Badlands is doing. But for now, it's going to be pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If you go to that URL today, again, badlandstoj.com, what you're going to see is a landing page that says soon. And March 1st is going to be the release date for the hats. Hopefully, we're going to do a better job with this unveiling than the Jets did for their uniforms in 2019, and uh, hopefully, they will do a better job with their uniform unveiling this year. But that's what we got going on, and so March 1st is the date to circle. We're going to have 50 available initially, so I assume they'll go fast, so hop on it on March 1st, and we'll get it out to you. And I will be absolutely getting my hands on one as well, so 49. Count them, 49 <laughs> remaining. Uh, that's awesome. Excited to finally bring you guys some merch. I know you've been clamoring for it, and the hats are sweet. Um, so everyone, check it out, March 1st. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you haven't already, upgrade to War Room tier on Patreon so you can check out all the amazing video content we're bringing to you and all the War Room content that all the guys have throughout the week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Let us know again in the comments or in the Discord if there's anything else you want to hear us talk about. In the off season, we'll be back to you guys next week. Peace.